Tim, are you set? Okay. My name is Jerry Buckley. I'm the director of school counseling here at Bishop Kenny. We'd like to welcome our families from the class of 2023 to our planning for college program. Uh, welcome to those in person tonight as well as those watching at home online. Uh, our speakers this evening are Mr. Scott Saberna, our school counselor with students' last names E through K, and Ms. Jackie Harden, who works with students' last names R through Z. We'd like to begin our program tonight with an invocation from our junior class president, Mr. Blaine Perry. If y'all would like to join me in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, give me the ability to trust you with all my heart, so my intentions and choices are truly yours, not mine. Let me be able to hear your voice when I'm lost. Allow me to wholeheartedly follow your commands and live the life you created me for. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Blaine. Uh, the packet we provided to you this evening has information that the speakers will be discussing specifically on the right-hand side, but we also have information on the left-hand side I'd like to review quickly as we get started. Uh, the first two pieces of information are our Preparing for College and Career Planning and Educational Choices booklets from the Woodburn Press, so we would encourage you to take a look at those at a later time. They really complement what we'll be talking about this evening very well. Uh, you see our junior bulletin, which is the yellow sheet. Uh, that's information that we went through with the students in the beginning of the school year and all of their religion classes for each grade level with specific things for the junior year. And again, a lot of things you'll hear us talking about this evening. You see our blue sheet, the transcript evaluations by other agencies. Again, a lot of important information. You'll hear us talk tonight about the core GPA, which is evaluated by the state university system, the Bright Future Scholarship Program, as well as the NCAA. So that's important information to be aware of as well. We have a college planning calendar for juniors from the college board. Uh, a lot of information, again, we'll be hitting this evening also. And then a reminder on the core GPA calculation. Uh, we'll be talking about grade point average, both cumulative and core GPA this evening, but another reminder for how the core is calculated. And then finally, the Florida Trends Next Magazine, which has a lot of good, from, in, good information about college and career happenings within the state of Florida. On our first slide, we liked, as we start off the program, to talk about factors influencing the admissions decision for college. And this is from the most recent NACAC survey with the college admissions people. Uh, grades in college prep classes, meaning in essence the core classes, English, math, science, social studies, and world language, is the key thing they'll be looking at. So like we talked about to the students in day one of their freshman year, doing as well as they can in their classes every day and getting those grades and keeping them as high as possible is a key part of being successful in the college application process. Then we talk about the grades in all courses, which again would make up the cumulative GPA, all the classes they take at Bishop Kenny, the strength of their curriculum overall, then their ACT and SAT scores, their essay, their demonstrated interest in the college, and so forth. So as you can see, the main things they're looking for is being successful in your grades every day, the strength of your curriculum, and then eventually the SAT and ACT that we'll be talking about tonight. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Saberna, and he will talk about starting your search in the college preparation process. All right, good evening, class of 2023. It's good to see you here tonight. Um, I would like to say to the juniors, if you kind of remember what Mr. Buckley said, you remember back to August when we came out to your religion class and we talked about that junior information packet that we gave you on your iPads and we told you to kind of save that in Schoology. If you remember, there was really kind of three things that we kind of focused on. What Mr. Buckley touched on was continuing your grades in your junior year. And then number two, as juniors jumping into that testing process, the SAT and ACT, which Ms. Harden's going to touch upon later and kind of go through that with you. And then the third thing is really starting that college search process, okay? So that's what I'm going to talk about now, how to kind of uh, begin to start your search and then kind of narrow down your choices. Um, 
here we're, you know, really when you're looking for colleges, you obviously want to be looking at colleges and universities that offer the academic programs that you might be interested in. But of course, there's going to be some of you who, even in senior year, may still be trying to figure that out and kind of trying to understand, okay, what do I want to major in? What areas do I want to focus on? So you want to kind of look at a, a wide range of majors that might pertain to you and some of the values that you have, the interests that you want to pursue in college. Um, what extracurricular activities, programs does the college or university offer that you may be interested? Some students are interested in studying abroad as soon as they can. Some students aren't maybe interested in that. Um, you have to really kind of narrow it down to what your individual students are looking for and then kind of take a look at the college and universities and what they have to offer. I always like to start with location because obviously you're going to spend four years or possibly more of your college career at the university that you decide to attend. So really kind of uh, carving out a location or an area, kind of spreading that net widely to begin with. You know, some students really want to go out of Jacksonville and for them that may mean you know, Tampa is far enough away. For other students, it's going to be, that's not far enough away. I need to really be looking in the East Coast, you know. So you have to define the locations that you would be interested in as a college student and then kind of try and narrow down your choices from there. Obviously, the, the other issues, looking at the size of the school, I like to kind of assimilate this one too. When you came to Bishop Kenny and you looked at this for your high school, maybe you looked at St. Joe's Academy and St. Augustine, comparing the size difference there, or Bishop Snyder. So it's the same thing when you're going to college, kind of looking at that size that is a good, a good fit for what you're looking for in your college experience. Um, many students look at the amount of attention a university offers them. Obviously, you go to the larger universities. You're going to be probably taking your general education requirement classes your first two years of college in large auditoriums with 100 plus students. And maybe you have two TV monitors where your professors are teaching. And then there's a question of, do the professors teach the classes? Or are we taught by graduate assistant students? So again, trying to understand as you're looking down that college search, what are you looking for in your own college experience? Some students benefit from that more hands-on, you know, 20 kids to a classroom where the professor might know their name and it's taught by a PhD professor as opposed to that professor's graduate assistant student who really is probably more focused on their graduate work than they are teaching you as a young college student. So these are some of the things that you also want to look at as you're asking uh, college representatives as you're meeting with them and you know kind of trying to again narrow down that choice. Social life. I'm sure there's probably parents out there who would like us to take this slide away and we'll say well, let's just focus on academics in college right but just like here at Bishop Kenny engaging the students in college and having them find those pieces those extracurriculars those clubs organizations whether they be, you know, the Greek life, whatever is going to be a good fit for that student is very important. The more that student is engaged, obviously the better they're going to feel about, you know, contributing not only to their academics, but also hopefully as you've been here at a college prep high school, learning how to prioritize my academic life with my social life is going to be very important once you get off, you know, on your own in college. So important things to consider. Um, money matters, obviously the cost of college continues to increase, um, so many families what we suggest is kind of sitting down and looking at your budget that you have or maybe that you don't have. Some parents have planned, you know, ever since their child was maybe before they were born with Florida prepaid savings plans or, you know, maybe grandma and grandpa have saved money on the side to help the student go to college. But you really need to kind of look at where you're at with your budget, how much colleges cost. Every college and university in the country has what we call a net price calculator on their website. That's a very handy tool for you to use to go to any college's website and be able to, to figure out 
the cost of going to that college. And I'm not just talking tuition, but also spending money. They account for everything. They account for gas money, travel, whatever it might be. Um, those net price calculators can really give you a good handle on what it's going to cost in today's terms to attend a college or university. Um, Scholarship-wise, we think of scholarships on two levels, really. There's need-based scholarships, and then there's merit-based scholarships. The need-based, obviously, for the students who, you know, you've looked at your budget and you have X amount of dollars, but now you know it's going to cost maybe $10,000 more, maybe fifteen, dollars depending upon where you're looking. Um, so you really have to consider that, and one of the best ways to do that is by taking a look at the FAFSA, or the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. This is the government's way of helping us pay for college. Um, if you look on handout number one, the pink, this is our favorite college websites, and you look under financial aid and scholarships, you'll see that second listing there is the FAFSA and their website. Um, as juniors and junior parents, I would caution you and remind you that the FAFSA opens up annually on October 1st. So it just opened up last Friday for our current senior class. So juniors and junior parents, you can be thinking, okay, I have a whole year before I can actually apply to FAFSA. However, what you can do between now and then is go to the FAFSA website, and if you want to write down next to that fafsa.ed.gov, when you go to that home page and you scroll down in the center, you'll see an estimator button. Okay, you can click on that and that will allow you to enter in, you'll need your parents' tax information, okay, and you're going to enter in assets, bank accounts, they're going to ask you lots of questions and obviously the better you give that information for what you have, the better you're going to get an estimate of what FAFSA might be able to help you pay for college with. Okay, so that's a good way to, to get started in that process and kind of understand what can FAFSA do for you as a student and you as a family, okay? Um, if you're looking at the other types of scholarships, we're talking merit-based scholarships, those are going to be based off of students' grades and test scores. Bright Futures is obviously the most common one that we think of in the state of Florida, but all universities have endowments, they have um, a financial aid link on their web pages that you can be going to and you can look at the different merit-based scholarships, what kind of grades they're looking for, what test scores, if there are any other requirements. And for students who are doing a good job, we're usually talking a core GPA. So the core classes again being English, math, science, history, foreign languages, around a 3.5, but sometime even dropping down to a 3.0, there's oftentimes merit scholarships that will be offered to a student when they apply to that university. Oftentimes that's nothing extra that you need to do. You don't have to do an extra application. It's just because you have good test grades, good scores, the university is going to offer you X amount of dollars. And obviously as the GPA and test scores go up, they're going to offer more money. So that's merit-based scholarships. As you're doing your search, um, the, the more you're finding a good fit with your school, and this, is, this oftentimes comes from speaking with the college representatives, they become very interested in certain students because they see that student as being a good fit for their university, their college, what they have to offer. So as you're doing that, oftentimes they can work with you more closely on finding a way to help pay for those college expenses, okay? Um, other ways to search would be uh, using your Naviance account, juniors. How many juniors have a Naviance account? All of you have a Naviance account, <laughs> okay? So juniors, if you don't know what I'm talking about, what you can do is you can Schoology message your counselor. We will send you a reset to your Bishop Kenny email and you'll be able to then have a link to the login page for Naviance. What is Naviance? It's basically a college and career database, but we also keep in there under colleges. There's a scholarships and money section. If we learn about a scholarship, we're going to post it in Naviance for all students to see because every student has a Naviance account. So that's a wonderful place to be looking at what is quite a long list of scholarships that would be available to students to apply to, okay? Um, 
Other things you could be doing, again, on the favorite college website, there uh, are several scholarship websites. If you look at the bottom, the one, there's a, a website called Going Mary. This is basically like Google for scholarships. So you can go to Going Mary, and it's a search engine. You put in your criteria, and it will go out and find different scholarships that you could apply to. Okay? We also have on the back of the sheet all of the state universities, all 12 of them, their websites, along with the private schools in the state of Florida. So this is a very handy um, uh, piece of paper that you can use to be, to be utilizing. Going back to FAFSA real quick, um, if you look at handout number two, one of the things I would suggest doing between now and next year when you could apply for FAFSA is really looking over the terms that go along with financial aid and scholarships. This sheet is very handy to help define some of those terms. And then maybe more importantly, looking at the myths that are out there regarding FAFSA and scholarships on the back of that sheet. We hear oftentimes from students like, oh, well, my parents said we're not going to do FAFSA because we make too much money or we don't think we'll qualify. But really, any financial aid office at any college university is going to encourage you do that FAFSA as soon as you can after October 1st and they will tell you they will come back and tell you what they're able to help you with you do not have to take the money you can take some of the money you can take all of it and again you don't, you can take none of the money but it's always a good idea to see and the sooner you apply you have to think of it as a big pot of money that's out there when that application opens up on October 1st of your senior year, the students who apply first and their families, they're going to have a better opportunity to get a bigger piece of that pie. So doing FAFSA is very important when it comes to money matters and figuring out how to pay for college because, again, it's very expensive. Other ways of doing college research in our office, we have what seems like an endless supply of pamphlets folders, paperwork that all the colleges and universities send to us or drop off to us. So there's always hard copy things you can be looking at and using. Students, again, your Naviance account, you can sit with your parents and be doing college searches. You can do career searches. You can start to keep a list of schools that you might be thinking about. You can find websites, virtual tours, um, what's nice about Naviance is if you do a search for a particular school, it's going to pull up a page that is kind of like a snapshot of that university. What, what kind of admissions criteria do they have? How many students attend? How much is the cost? What kind of academic programs? It, it's really nice because it, it puts it mostly on one page. If you go to a university's website, it's going to take you a while to navigate that because they're all different. They're not all set up the same. You're going to have to find those academic programs. That's always going to be the best place to go, but it does take a little bit longer than going to Naviance and kind of looking at a snapshot and then kind of saying, oh, yeah, this might be a college I'm interested. Let me favorite that. Or in Naviance, what it'll be is it'll be a little heart, and you tap on that heart, and it's going to keep that school in your list of schools that you're thinking about. Okay, again, you can do scholarship searches in Naviance. Again, career webs, career searches, college majors, um, different college websites, of course. So you know, again, looking specifically at a school's website is going to be the most up-to-date information on the academic programs. Again, finding that nice net price calculator and being able to help you kind of determine what you need to do. Utilizing your connections, people that you know, family, friends, relatives who have gone to school recently or, you know, um, maybe students who just graduated, but kind of talking to other people about what schools they're looking at is good. You always want to remember, though, that college fit, that college experience is unique to you as a student. So you have to be looking for what you're interested in in college, okay? Uh, another good way is doing virtual tours or attending virtual college fairs. 
the one we have listed here is put on by the NACAC, like Mr. Buckley mentioned earlier, which is the National Association of College Admission Counselors. So they have several dates and they do different regions of the country. It's nice because it's virtual now. It was always held one day on a Saturday at the Prime Osborne Center in October. And if you missed that day, you kind of missed it until next year. So it's actually nice that they're virtual now because you can go there and hear hundreds of colleges from across the country and kind of listen to what they're looking for as far as admission criteria um, that there might be you know, looking at when they look at particular students. Juniors, as juniors now this year, and then again as seniors next year, in your Naviance account, you have access to, under, on the home page in Naviance, under what's new section, is a list of all of the colleges and universities that are coming to visit us here at Bishop Kenny. Some of them still are, are Zooming in virtually, but as a junior, you can sign up for those. We do ask that students only do one a day, of course, because again, grades are most important, so we want you to be in class, and then two a week. So that's kind of a, a general rule. Now, if you've gone to two that week, but let's say UNF's coming and you really want to see UNF, I would say talk to your individual counselor. We can still probably you know, get you into that session, but it's a great way for students to ask questions, just simply listen sometimes, maybe get their name on their mailing list, um, but meeting with college representatives and hearing what they're looking for is, is great exposure between now and next fall when you guys will be seniors and you're starting that application process. Nothing really takes the place of a college visit because it really gives you the feel of what it's like to be on campus, to really see the dorms, you know, see you know, the cafeterias and what food options they have, really being able to talk to other students who are on campus and what their experience is like is invaluable. Many, many schools are open now, whereas last year they, had, they were only doing virtual tours, um, but some of them are limiting their capacity. So I would say if you're planning to go to a bigger university because you want to see it, you really probably want to plan at least a month in advance, but you can go to their admission links on their website and schedule yourself for a visit. Um, oftentimes when you pull up for a college visit, they may have your name in the parking space where they ask you to park, you know, they send students out to greet you. Um, it's a really a good way to get, get some good experience of what it's going to be like to be at a university. Handout number three is a college comparison worksheet. This would be, you know, as you're starting to narrow down your choices and you maybe have three, four, five, six schools that you're looking at, then you really want to break it down based on some individual criteria that's unique to you as a student and what you're looking for. So that sheet can come in handy as you're going through that process. At the beginning, I mentioned kind of casting that wide net of looking, you know, in whatever region or areas or states that you might be interested in. Um, oftentimes, students will just automatically say, well, you know, I really, I don't really think I could go out of state because I couldn't afford it. Out of state tuition is, you know, is a lot more expensive and it can be more expensive, but there are ways for students, again, if you're utilizing that FAFSA, if you're taking advantage of your classes and, and improving your grades and your test scores, that oftentimes students apply to the University of Alabama and they get accepted and then they really fall in love with the school and they're thinking, I wasn't even thinking of going to Alabama or even going out of state. And a lot of times, you know, it takes looking beyond what you might be immediately thinking about and looking at and seeing what they have to offer. Plenty of universities in the states around Florida, they understand they're competing against Bright Futures. So that means they're going to go out of their way, if you're a good student, to try and bring you to the University of Alabama, to Auburn, to University of Georgia, Georgia Southern, right? They know that it's, it's something for a student to give up Bright Futures and go out of state to school. So what they try and do is try and bring that cost down by offering scholarship money if they can. They can't accept the Bright Futures money. The Bright Futures money cannot leave the state of Florida, and I believe Ms. Harden's going to talk more specifically about Bright Futures soon, but a university like that's in Georgia can say to you, 
well, we'll compensate you. You are going to get X amount of dollars for Bright Futures, so we're can give, we can give you this scholarship to help bring that cost down to what you, it would cost you to go to Florida State, for example, or UNF. Okay, so never rule out anything. If you want to, if you know, if you're thinking about another a school that's out of state, keep looking at it. Keep talking to the representatives. See what they can do for you, and do it early. That's going to help you the most. Um, community and state colleges. This is a great way for students, you know, of all ranges, all GPAs, all test scores. Oftentimes, going to that state or community college is just the best next step for a student to continue in higher education, right? Could be financial reasons, could be you're not ready to leave home yet. Could be you want to stay at home, get a part-time job, take classes, you know, at FSCJ, for example, or for many students, you know, getting into the University of Florida, getting into the to Florida State University, their admission criteria is pretty high now, right? So for students coming right out of high school, oftentimes, if you don't have that 3.5 and, you know, maybe a 1300 on your SAT or a 29 on your ACT, it may be questionable whether or not you can get into Florida State or the University of Florida. So oftentimes students will opt to say, well, I'm going to go to Santa Fe or I'm going to go to TCC. I'm going to find that pathway that eventually leads me to that Florida State diploma or that Gator diploma, whatever it is that you're interested in. So there's plenty of different options that are out there. Honors programs are a great way for students to set themselves apart now in college, especially if you're looking to go on to graduate school. So um, almost all universities have an honors program now. Sometimes there's different admission criteria. Sometimes universities will offer you admission to the, to the honors program if you have you know, the grades and test scores that they're looking for. So I would encourage you to look at those as well. And really, you know, finding what works for individual students. We always say that it's not so much where you go to college, it's what you do with it, right? So if you start at FSCJ and you're working hard towards that and you got that part-time job, but you just keep at it and you eventually transfer to the University of Florida, nobody's going to know where you started, right? You're going to have that University of Florida diploma on your wall one day. So really kind of trying to make that path work for you is what we encourage. All right, so Ms. Harden's going to jump into standardized testing now, and thank you. All right, good evening. Thank you so much for coming, and it's good to see you guys. I'm going to be talking about standardized testing, so PSAT, SAT, and ACT, and kind of the ins and outs of each. So I'm going to start first with PSAT. Last week, we went into the junior classes to discuss the PSAT, and in that conversation, they were given a practice test. So parents, just heads up, they have a practice test somewhere in their book bags. They also have access to one online so that they can start preparing. The PSAT is going to take place at Bishop Kenny on October 13th, so that's next Wednesday, and that's going to be in their flex mod. Uh, this is basically a practice SAT. It's to give them an idea of where they would score on an actual SAT. It also gives them a chance to see where they need to focus to improve their scores. So uh, just a little bit of a breakdown of what, how it differs from the actual SAT. There is still two big sections, the evidence-based reading and writing section and the math section. Each of those sections are worth 760 points for a total of 1520. So an actual SAT is worth 1600 points. This is a little less. Um, this is also the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. So if students score in the top half of the top 1% almost, they may be asked to uh, input information and become a semifinalist, which is going to be released next September. Uh, Students will be able to access their scores starting on December 6th and 7th. That's going to be their College Board accounts. So that's where they can access this. This is where they'll be able to see 
with the breakdown, not only the overall scores, the 15, 20 or lower, the 760 on each section, but then you can drill down and see the individual sections for the evidence-based reading and writing, that, um, uh, separate sections for that uh, math so that they can get a chance to see what areas they can focus on when they start taking the SAT and ACT. So there are things, like I said, they do have the practice books somewhere in their backpack. They do have the online options, um, and that's available through College Board. The other things that they can access to prepare is Khan Academy. That's a really great um, tool. They have access to this because they did it in ninth and 10th grade. Um, and then this year, they're actually using a different program called UWorld. And uh, they can access, or most uh, English and math classes are assigning work in that uh, site. So they can practice that way as well. All right, SAT. So PSAT leads into the actual SAT. And again, there's two big sections on this, the evidence-based reading and writing um, and the math section. In each section, it's pretty much the same as the PSAT. You'll be given your overall score, which is the 1600. Um, and each section is worth 800. Uh, if you would like to see what a score report looks like, that is handout number seven, the yellow sheet. You can see kind of how that is broken down. Um, and on the back, it will show like the summary of scores. So what happens is we suggest that students take at least two SATs uh, so that they can see their uh, progress over each test and see what they need to focus on. Uh, the idea is that a lot of colleges and scholarships will super score. So what I mean by super score is they'll take the highest section of the reading and writing, they'll take the highest math and put those together. They don't have to be from the same uh, sitting of the test and they'll give the highest overall SAT score. And most colleges and uh, universities as well as the scholarship program that uh, we'll talk about later on will super score. All right. Uh, there is an uh, essay section on the SAT that's typically an added cost if that's something the students want to do. I would highly encourage the students to look at the admissions requirements for the colleges that they're interested in. Uh, a couple years ago, the colleges were saying that they wanted students to take the essay. Uh, and they're slowly getting away from that. So I would highly recommend that you guys check that out to see if that's something that you guys want to pursue. For the ACT, this is a little different from the SAT, where the SAT was two sections, the ACT is four sections. Uh, it breaks down into English, math, reading, and uh, science reasoning. The scoring is different too. So the highest that you can get in each section is a 36. The composite score is an average of those four tests. Uh, I would highly recommend the students take two ACTs. So two SATs and two ACTs. These are two completely different tests. And some students find that they do really well on the SAT um, and not so great on the ACT. And some students find they really gravitate towards the ACT um, and kind of leave the SAT behind. So I would highly suggest taking both of them and then seeing which is the best one that you guys feel um, that you can get the best score overall. Uh, and like I said, the handout for that to see the breakdown of the ACT is on uh, handout number eight. It's the blue one and it really breaks it down. The other thing that the ACT will do uh, when you go to register is it will ask you a oh, a lot of questions about careers, interest, grades, and a lot of times on the back of that score report, they're going to show you kind of how that breaks down. So heads up, um, if you're going to register for an ACT, it seems like it may take 20 to 25 minutes because they're asking all those individual questions. All right. So these next two section or next two handouts I'm looking at are the both pink ones. You've got the concordance scores as well as the national dates. Uh, just heads up with the concordance scores. This is kind of sh to show you how 
Uh, the ACT and the SAT scores compare to one another, so it shows that how the SAT compares to ACT and how ACT compares to SAT. Uh, this was last published back in 2018, so this is what we have available. There may be some updates um, on different uh, websites, however, we haven't came across those that have been put out by actual SAT or ACT. So, preparing to test. Picking your test date. Notice that most of the test dates for SAT and ACT are going to be on Saturday mornings. Uh, most of the time, you're going to want to apply about a month in advance. They do have deadlines. If you don't meet that deadline, it's fine. You can pay an extra $25 to try and get in. Uh, but if, if you're on top of things, you won't have to pay that extra $25. Uh, you will go online and register at either collegeboard.com, which you guys all should have, uh, you all should have uh, registered for that already, uh, with Khan Academy, and then actstudent.org. Uh, again, that is going to take 20 to 25 minutes. Once you have that login information, you can go and register to test. Um, I would look at the dates carefully. It, you can switch dates if you need to, um, if something comes up, but again, there's an added cost to that. The other thing that the ACT has been doing at some locations is they've offered Sunday testing. Uh, so that may be something, especially if you're cross country or football or in a sport that plays on Friday or Saturday and you want to um, have that option of a Sunday test. Look, it's, they're becoming fewer and fewer as different testing sites um, decide not to do it, but just to give you a heads up, they may have that still available. All right. So how to prepare. There's the free booklets. They're available at, in the guidance office. I'm sorry, Office of School Counseling. I still get that mixed up. Uh, so they are available. That's the paper packet that has the practice SAT in it or the practice ACT, and it gives you little uh, tips about it. It's something that you can walk in, you can ask the counselors, you can ask Ms. Nakashi who sits at the front desk, and we'll just point and say, go ahead and take one. Um, most students walk in and grab it and then walk out. You'll be given your PSAT score report back in January. Um, you'll also get your test book. So you'll be able to go back and see how you answered, what was correct, uh, if you wrote notes in the test book, you can see whether or not you were on the right path, or if you weren't, why may, you may not have gotten that answer correct. So that's another tool to kind of just dive a little deeper and see what it is that you need to focus on. Test prep guides. All right, so this is a fancier word for those big giant books that we used to get in high school. Um, that was huge. Uh, either Princeton Review or Barron, you would find these in the bookstores. You can still find them in the resource or the reference section of the libraries. Uh, if you need something like tangible, a hard copy, those are still available and you can order them through Amazon or like I said, uh, Barnes and Noble, Books A Million, you can still find those books. Um, they also, most of those companies also offer online um, our software programs where, depending on your student, they can dive deep into it and really truly study or they can spend five minutes and then walk away um, each day. But they do have those, they do help, it's just the diligence of the student with that. How deep is that student going to dive to prepare for uh, the SAT and the ACT? With test preparation courses, this provides a little more structure. This may provide more one-on-one -on -one contact. And so instead of leaving it up to the student to do it on their own, now they have somebody to focus on. Uh, so it's a great option. I know we offer many here on Sundays uh, before test dates. So that might be something students want to look at. Um, when you're choosing, look for programs that are respected. They have, um, they have gone through the training. They know what they're talking about. They can say that I have helped students, all right? Um, it's a lot of times uh, people come across and they're like, I can help you. 
and they promise these grandiose like scores, and it's just talk. There's not there. It's fluff. It, they don't have it, the scores to back it up. So I would really caution you with that, um, because unfortunately there are people out there looking to make a quick buck. So you want to make sure it is somebody who is respected or a known uh, organization who has specific programs focused for SAT or ACT. Um, typically, it's going to be about a 10 to 15 hour program. It's not something that you can cover all the tricks, all the tips, all the ideas for the SAT and ACT in an hour or two. It's something that needs to be practiced and it should be about 10 to 15 hours. I know students don't wanna hear that, but you really get a gist of what's going on and really how um, they score it. And again, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So that's what I tell my students a lot of times, not only with test prep, but also with a lot of the colleges as well. If they're promising you things and it sounds a little too good, it probably is. So state minimum test scores. This is something that the state of Florida has said, these are the minimums for students to get into college. Now I really uh, caution students when they look at these state minimum test scores. Uh, SAT for reading and math is a 460. For ACT reading, uh, math is 19 and an English is 18. So that may sound a little on the low side, especially if you've started looking at colleges. So this is the very bare minimum. It doesn't mean that colleges have to accept you with this. It just means this is where they start. So if you're looking at a highly competitive school, if you're looking at a Florida, a Florida State, their scores that they're going to start looking at is going to be much higher, okay? What we use the state minimum test scores for really is when you're going into a state college like an FSCJ, a Santa Fe, a Valencia, uh, this is deciding whether or not uh, you guys are going into remedial classes or right into English and math college classes. So a remedial class at a uh, college level is not necessarily a college class. You're paying for it, so money's coming out of pocket, but it doesn't mean you're getting the college credit for that. So you really kind of want to make sure that you have those scores going in so that your advisor at that level is not trying to put you into a remedial course. You're going directly into a college course and you're starting to earn college credit. There's a new uh, word that we've heard over the last couple of years, especially with COVID. We've heard more and more uh, colleges and universities saying they're going test optional, partly because it was hard to find ACT and SAT tests being offered in a lot of places over the last two years. Uh, so what test optional means is that students don't necessarily have to submit SAT or ACT scores. If they decide to do the test option, optional option, then they're going to put the emphasis on the student's GPA, on the student's uh, rigor of courses, on the essay. They're going to put that, that emphasis there rather than on the actual test scores. So a lot of students, if they don't test well, it gives them the option to show this is who I am as a student. This doesn't reflect what I can do. Now, a lot of students are like, well, that's, that's great. That's the option I'm going for. Heads up, there are no state, Florida State public universities that are test optional. They all require SATs and ACT scores. So heads up on that. Uh, the other thing is that's not always the best thing. Sometimes students can definitely score in the ranges that those colleges and universities are looking for, and they can get in using that score. It may not be the best score that the, college, that the student thinks that they can get, but they can still get in with that score. So I always tell my students, look at what they're asking for. If you're meeting that, go ahead and submit your test scores. The other thing that a lot of um, students don't realize that yes, they might be test optional for admissions, but they may not be test optional for giving out scholarships. So you could be losing money by not submitting your scores. So just, I'm, I can't imagine like passing that up. 
So uh, I would look at the fine print. I would look and see what the students, where the students are with their testing range. And if they're falling within that, it doesn't hurt them to submit those test scores. All right. And then looking at page 10, the handout, the green page, Florida Bright Futures. So as Mr. Saberna referenced this earlier, uh, the state of Florida has a scholarship program that rewards students who have uh, based off of their merit. So uh, on page 10, I just want to point your attention to the specific classes that they're using uh, to recalculate these GPAs. Uh, they are looking at the four English classes at the high school level, the four math classes, including Algebra 1 and higher. They're looking at three natural sciences, and they have to have labs with that. All, this, all our science programs here have labs. And then uh, the three specific social studies classes, that's world history, US history, and government and economics. And then two consecutive years of foreign language, Spanish 1, Spanish 2. Uh, Latin one, Latin two. That's what they're looking for. So only 16 classes. Uh, we're going to recalculate that GPA, and if it's at a recalculated 3.5, and then they turn around and score either a 29 on the ACT or a 1330 on the SAT, and they should have 100 hours of community service because it's required for graduation, then they would uh, qualify for the Florida Academic Scholars, or Florida Academic Scholars Scholarship. Uh, for student, or for you guys who went to school uh, 2000 and a little prior, that used to be known as the 100% scholarship, where 100% of the tuition was paid for. Uh, so that's a nice chunk of change that stays in your pocket. All right, uh, students should strive for that. For the Florida Medallion Scholars, that's that recalculated GPA of a 3.0, uh, 1210 on the SAT or a 25 on the ACT, and at least 75 hours of community service or more. So again, that is that 75% uh, of tuition paid for. So both of those are really great scholarships. It keeps a lot of students here in the state of Florida. It doesn't leave the state of Florida. Um, at a private institution, while they won't match 75% of a uh, percent tuition of the private school money, they'll give what is the equivalent of 75% of tuition at a public school to a private school student. So it still works out, and it's still a great opportunity for students. We will talk to students every year to tell them if they're on track for Florida Bright Futures. Uh, so they should have an idea when we start our junior appointments uh, later on in the school year about where they are and what they may need to do uh, to be eligible for that. All right, so at this point, I'll turn this back over to Mr. Buckley so he can go over the timeline. Thank you, Ms. Harden. Like Ms. Harden said, if you go ahead and take out handout number 11, we're going to look at the timeline for juniors. And this is something we went through with the students in the religion class at the beginning of the year. And just a couple highlights we want to hit. Um, right now, obviously, we're in October. So being here tonight or watching online tonight is a great way to kind of get going with the college search process on Monday, October 4th, for our planning for college program. As Ms. Harden talked about, we're taking the PSAT next Wednesday, October 13th. Note that there is an SAT at Bishop Kenny on Saturday, December 4th. So that's some, a one a lot of times juniors like to hit, so that's definitely something to be aware of. If you flip it over to the back, jumping down to March, we would encourage you to plan out summer activities, whether that's doing uh, a summer job, internship, uh, college visits, uh, doing a summer program on a college campus, that's a great time to start to plan and never, to, never hurts to get it going early as well. And then during this, the uh, Mar month of March as well, we will select courses for the senior year. So that's definitely a key thing. Um, as we've talked about, a lot of times when the colleges are looking at your applications in your senior year and your transcript, they're really looking at your first three years of grades but they're also certainly looking at the strength of your courses. So taking the old days, 
you know, which is a long time ago now when you can say, well, I could just take easy classes my senior year. That's been gone for a long time. You really need to have a healthy schedule because they will look at the strength of your schedule. And there are some colleges that will come back and actually look at your grades from senior year. So it's important to make sure you have a good, healthy schedule as a senior. And then in April, we talk about making college visits, and Mr. Saberna talked about that. And we always would encourage you as much as possible to get onto the college campus. Just like here at Bishop Kenny, if you came to visit on a Sunday, you would know we have a beautiful campus, but without the students here, you really can't get the, the exact experience of the school itself. And that's the same thing with the colleges. So we would encourage you to try to get, to get there as best you can when the college students are there to get a real true feel for what the campus looks like. So we've talked about, uh, we've taken you through the junior year, we talked about grades, the search process, uh, and standardized testing. We want to talk now about, uh, get a snapshot of the senior year, what you'd be looking forward to really about a year from now, getting all the college applications together. So we would encourage our students to have um, at least three schools they look at. One um, being what you would consider possibly a stretch school, as in a school that uh, maybe um, it's just very, very difficult to get into. You know, for example, like a Yale University, they'll say, you know, they routinely reject valedictorians um, because it just, again, how many students apply to their school. They may take number two from your class and not number one, but it's just that super competitive at those upper level schools. So, but we also would encourage you to apply to those schools. You know, you never know what they're looking for. If you put together a great application practice, uh, package between your transcript, your essays, your recommendations that we'll talk about. We always encourage you to shoot for your dreams, but also make sure you're, you have backup plans as you go through. So you've got stretch schools, you've got good fits, where if you look at there, okay, this is what their average GPA and test scores that they're looking for. I think I meet or very close to what they're looking for. We obviously want to incur apply to those schools as well. And then have at least one safe school where you know you exceed what they're looking for and you feel, even if I don't get into that stretch or even that good fit, I do have some backups to fall upon. Um, certainly you can apply to more than one in each category, but you don't want to just apply to six uh, stretch schools where you're not really sure if I'm going to get into any of those. You want to have a good balance and a backup plan regardless of how you go through. As far as admissions policies, if you take out handout number 12, we'll take a look at those. Uh, some turns to be aware of as you go through the process. There can be what we call early action, and that's where you apply early to the school, uh, and they will give you a decision earlier than the regular applicant pool. That is typically not a binding contract, meaning you can apply early action to multiple schools. The next term, early decision, is what they call a binding contract, meaning that you can only apply early decision to one college. And you're basically saying to that school, if you accept me, I'm definitely coming to your college. And you actually sign a form that your parents sign as well as your school counselor. Uh, there are no schools in Florida in the state university system that have an early decision. A school like University of Miami will have it and different smaller private schools, but there are also plenty of schools outside of the state that do have the early decision process. Early decision can mean different things at different colleges as well. So at some schools it may be easier to get in if you go through early decision, and some schools it may be a little more difficult. So you really want to research that, and that's another great time to talk to your school counselor and have a good feel for what that school in particular is looking for as far as early decision. Then there's regular decision, which could just be they have a specific deadline, for example, Florida and Florida State have a November 1st deadline. You meet that deadline, you'll get your decision in February. That's typically what we call regular decision. And there's also rolling decisions, which mean rolling admissions, which meaning that whenever you apply, usually four to six weeks later, you'll get a response. For example, UCF has that process where you get your information in, and then typically four to six weeks later, you will get a response from them. The application packet. So that's, this is where we'll talk about uh, really our next uh, five handouts, um, starting with number 13. Uh, holistic admissions is something that's really become popular over the last 10, 15 years, meaning that they're going to be looking at things outside of your grades and test scores. So putting your best foot forward with your essay, your recommendations, all those different things will be key. Certainly your transcript will be the most important thing they look at, but they'll also want to see how you made Bishop Kenny a better place and how you're going to make their school community a better place. So for example, handout number 13, we'll talk about the essay. Uh, again, we always encourage you, especially if you feel like you're borderline for a college, if they 
make an essay available, you definitely want to do that and, and follow through it and do a great job with it. Your school counselor can review it with you. Your junior English teacher a lot of times will assign that or at least give you some feedback on it. And the ultimate thing with the essay is that they want to find out more about you as a student. Yes, they want to see how you write and all those different things, but you want to bring out something that maybe they can't tell just from your transcript and your test score. So the essay can be a key, com key component to the process. Uh, handout number 14 is a sample resume. There's a front and a back to that, just two different samples there. One is by type of activity on, on the back side. It's by grade level. Again, you want to show them how you've made Bishop Kenny a better place and how you make their college campus a better place. So the things you've been involved in from ninth grade, like we talked to you about getting involved, maybe by the time you're a junior or even a senior, getting involved in leadership activities as well, showing your leadership on campus, and again, how you can make that college a better place. And then the next two handouts, 15 and 16, are examples of our um, counselor and teacher recommendation request forms. So again, there may be some schools that require recommendations. Typically, if they do, they will require two from teachers and one from your school counselor. So this, this will be the paperwork that you turn into your school counselor and your teachers at that time when they're looking for the recommendations. Um, a lot of your teachers in the junior year will say, if you want me to write a college recommendation next year for your senior year, give it to me in the spring or at least before you leave school as a junior, and then they'll work on it over the summer. So again, this is a great way to get that started. Um, and we'll talk about next year. If they don't require recommendations, then you don't want to submit them to because, again, you want to be respectful of what their process is. For example, the state universities don't use recommendations in their process. So Florida State says every year, absolutely do not send them to us because we're not reading them. And you're kind of showing them you really haven't done your research as far as that school. On the other hand, certainly there's schools that do require them. And they're very important, so you want to do a great job as far as your research, as far as that goes. Handout number 17 is an example of our school transcript. So you'll see how this is listed as far as grades throughout your four years of high school, or at least your three years plus your senior year schedule. You'll see the grades. You'll see the current schedule for the senior year. Down the bottom, you'll see the cumulative GPA, which includes all classes throughout high school. Uh, then you'll see the class rank, overall 30, uh, total service hours and then eventually when you do graduate when your final transcript is sent to the college they will see that as well. Um, now we'll talk about in a few moments about the transcript because uh, in again probably eight years ago every school required a transcript that has changed a little bit and we'll talk about that in a few moments also. All right, so again, timeline for seniors. Uh, so this, this is this year's timeline. Obviously, next year's will be, a little, will be updated based on the dates for the class of 2023. But you can see there's a number of different things we have highlighted on there, whether it be we have a similar program to this in early September next year. Again, it'll be more enhanced information as far as the actual application process, but we would strongly encourage you to come to that. We also, that we, when we combine that with the activities office, so we also talk about graduation, grad, grad bash, the prom, and all that different stuff as well. Um, one of the check marks talks about registering with the NCAA Clearinghouse. So you want to do that at some point in the summer of your junior year, or excuse me, your summer before your senior year to get registered with the NCAA. And that's if you're looking to play college sports on the Division I or Division II level, whether that's scholarship or walk-on. And again, like I said, you can take a look at that later on and kind of see the different highlights for the senior year and things you can be looking forward to there. Uh, Mr. Saberna talked a lot about Navience. Uh, you can access, access that website through the Bishop Kenny website. If you go onto the academics page and then under school counseling, you'll see a link for it there. Again, every student has had a um, user ID for that since their freshman year. You can use it right now to sign up for college visits. Uh, you can also do career interest inventories on that, as well as eventually when you're sending your transcripts to college as a senior, you'll be communicating with your counselor through that. So that's definitely a key thing you want to be aware of, and obviously mom and dad, you can take a look at that account with them as well. Know that the Common App um, will be a key part of your process potentially next year. Uh, it's there are over, as it says, over 500 different colleges and universities that are available to apply to on there, mostly private, but there are some public schools on there right now, including Florida, 
Florida State, UCF, and UNF. So again, it's putting your demographic information into the college app, into the Common App one time, and it kind of it, it kind of narrows down the work you have to do. Now, we also would strongly encourage you to research on the college's website specifically what they're looking for, because a lot of times they will require supplemental information as opposed to just the basics on the Common App. But that's something to be aware of. You can take a look at that now, and when you have your list of schools you'll be applying to as you enter your senior year, you can get a good idea about what their options are on there as well. Self-reported student academic record. So that is, like I mentioned, uh, in the old days, we would send transcripts to every college. Now, the state universities and some of the other schools are starting to branch into this as well, meaning that we will give the student an unofficial copy of their transcript with all their grades on it, and they will actually hand enter their grades as part of their application. So they will say, I got a B plus in English one my freshman year, I got an A in geometry, and so forth. Now, obviously, when they accept you, it's pending, the reception of your final transcript. So if you happen to add, add a couple points to your GPA in the process, eventually they will figure that out. So you have to put it in obviously the right way. But um, it's really streamlined it. It's been great for us as far as, uh, again, like I said, streamlining the process. Currently eight of the 12 state universities use it. Florida Gulf Coast, FIU, and USF do not, and then UCF does not, but they, ought, they use something called SPARK, which is very similar. So again, just something to know about as you're getting ready for the process next year in your senior year. Handouts number 19 and 20 are our final two for the evening, and these are the matrices for the state universities in Florida as well as the private colleges and universities in Florida. And like Mr. Saberna said, we would encourage you to look at all schools, in-state, out-of-state, public and private, but we do know because of the Bright Future Scholarship, because of the great tuition rates that Florida has and the strong schools that we have, a lot of students like to stay in Florida. So it's important to research exactly what they're looking for as far as their core GPA, uh, whether it's easier to get in for summer admission, which we'll talk about in more detail next year, but you can apply for summer or fall admission. You can look at their average SAT and ACT scores as well. So there's a lot of great information, honors programs, what type of application they use, and so forth. So we would strongly encourage you to take a look at this uh, and really get familiar with the different schools and what they're looking for for the state universities as well as the private schools such as Flagler, Embry-Riddle, and so forth. Uh, the college readiness appointments for, for juniors will begin in late November. Um, anytime you have questions, we always encourage the students, they can always message us. They can always come in and sign up for an appointment as well. Uh, I know I was supposed to uh, make a plug for our school play, which is coming up. So I'm going to do that right now. That's the Adams family. Let's see if I got it here. So, Mrs. Wilkes asked me to promote, so uh, October 15th and 16th, so on Friday night the 15th at 7 o'clock at night, uh, and then there are two showings on the 16th Saturday. There's a 2 o'clock, 2.30 show and a 7 p.m. show, uh, so we would strongly encourage you to, to come out to that, which will be a great program. Tickets are available at bishopkennyboxoffice.org. There's also a link on the Bishop Kenny website, but you can check that out, and it will be a great show. Uh, we appreciate you coming out here tonight and also those of you watching online. Uh, our counselors will be available, available for questions afterwards if you have anything specific. And we look forward to having a great school year. Thank you very much.